Tonight, the soft power of the monarchy has been one of Britain's strongest brands. But could the allegations of racism from the young royals shape our standing in the wider world? Tonight, we ask how the Commonwealth countries will respond to what they've heard from Meghan and Harry. Will any of this change relations or even minds in the long term? We speak live with Australia and Barbados. Also tonight... The so-called fake New York heiress Anna Sorokin gives her first UK broadcast interview to Newsnight. Has crime paid for you? Um, in a way, it did. Hello, good evening. The Queen's message to the Commonwealth feels like it belongs to another age. Astonishing to think it was delivered just two days ago. In it, she spoke of testing times. Then it was a reference to COVID. Now it has the weight of prescience and huge significance. Today, the palace finally broke its silence to address the royal interview with Meghan and Harry. By statement, the Queen expressed her concern over the race allegations in particular that will, she said, be dealt with privately within the family. But the Queen is head not just of the family or even the state, but of this wide and diverse group of Commonwealth nations. The soft power offered by the monarchy is huge. But things feel particularly delicate right now, post-Brexit, amidst accusations of broken promises from our EU partners and within the re-examination of our colonial past. How will the words of the young royals be heard around the world? Will it inspire ripples of Republican thought or an even greater loyalty to the Crown? Here's Seema Katecha. I hope we shall maintain this renewed sense of closeness and community. Just days ago, the Queen delivered a message of unity to the Commonwealth. Her sentiments were without ambiguity. Friendship, working together, mutual support, words uttered to display a sense of respect and equality among all the member nations. As we celebrate the friendship, spirit of unity and achievements of the Commonwealth, we have an opportunity to reflect on a time like no other. I know how you want to see someone who But while like the Queen focused on relaying a message of togetherness, Meghan and Harry accused the institution which she leads of being the total opposite. Racist, controlling, neglectful. There's a conversation with you... With Harry. ...about how dark your baby is going to be? potentially, and what that would mean or look like. Ooh. It sent shockwaves around the world. They're really trying to send a message about what institutions, including the one that they were part of, need to do to be more uh, dynamic and forward-looking than they currently are. After the end of the Queen's reign, that is the time for us to say, OK, we've passed that watershed. Do we really want to have whoever happens to be the king or queen of the UK uh, automatically our head of state? But New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern said it wouldn't increase the country's appetite for change in its constitutional arrangements. Today, the palace issued a statement on behalf of the Queen, saying... The issues raised, particularly that of race, are concerning. Whilst some recollections may vary, they are taken very seriously and will be addressed by the family privately. Since the birth of the modern Commonwealth in 1949, leaders of former British Empire territories have wanted the British monarch to remain a part of their identity. Although independent, they chose for the crown to be a symbol of the Commonwealth Association. The royal family has frequently travelled to the places within the realm, wanting to show its continued support. Meghan and Harry claim to have even suggested moving to New Zealand or South Africa to take up a less active role. But now there are questions as to how damaging Meghan's claims of racism could be to the diverse populations the Queen represents. When the time comes for Charles to succeed, he may find that his relationship with the Commonwealth may have been damaged. And what do you think that means? What does damaged mean?
you know, the Commonwealth is a voluntary association. And if people feel that the head of the Commonwealth or his family have a problem with race, I think it will make the Commonwealth's future more difficult. I don't think it does any damage to the royal family um, or to the monarchy. She has done her duty, and I think she's loved across her realms for that. And I don't think interviews uh, with chat show hosts in the United States makes a great deal of difference to that. Equality and democracy are two of the central themes of the Commonwealth. For many, the British Empire was about domination and discrimination. That's why these allegations are so damaging for the royals, potentially depicting them as living in the past rather than living in the present. This episode won't be forgotten. The Black Lives Matter movement, coronavirus and its disproportionate impact on the black and Asian population only make what Meghan said come into sharper focus. Seema Kotecha with that report and our diplomatic editor Mark Urban is here. I guess what we're asking is will it be a moment that changes everything or nothing at all? What has been reaction that you've seen from across the Commonwealth so far? Well I tell you what I've spent this evening looking at literally dozens of news outlet websites all the way from the Caribbean to Africa to Malaysia to India. Um, it, generally speaking they've gone on the uh, royal statement today the Queen's reaction. A couple of them I thought rather interestingly bringing up the headline recollections may vary. Uh, so showing that showing some sort of uh, judgment there I think uh, interestingly the star and the Malay Mail both gave quite a lot of prominence to a story featuring Meghan's dad essentially rubbishing the interview uh, so showing some partiality there I think in Malaysia um, in the Anglosphere obviously you've got a more detailed type of coverage and a fuller examination the Globe and Mail in Toronto with a, a supportive article to the couple uh, Meghan and Harry interview shows the royal family is stuck in the past their columnist however However, the age in Melbourne, a pretty sharp one in the other direction, um, uh, saying that uh, Meghan had done the interview extremely effectively, but uh, therefore very damagingly to the monarchy, and saying about Harry that he was keen for gaudy fame and ready to trade family loyalty for pieces of silver. Gosh. Um, what do we think, then, are the, are the longer-term prospects for the monarchy. Are there, are there actual Republican pressures or is this just day after You've stuff? got the, the very fast timescales of these news cycles. Then you've got the big gravitational shifts in Commonwealth countries. Do they want uh, the sovereign as their head of state or uh, in other forms? Not all countries in the Commonwealth, of course, have uh, the Queen as their head of state. This doesn't get tested very often. I mean, St Vincent and the Grenadines had a re referendum in 2009. They voted by a pretty big majority to keep the Queen. The subject is under discussion in Barbados. I know you'll be talking about that mm. later. I, I think the really interesting point made by both Malcolm Turnbull and Diane Abbott in the package there is what happens when you get to Prince Charles. I mean, it's been said by many people that Prince Charles uh, was faced with the most damaging allegations of any member of the royal family in this interview. Uh, there's clearly a very damaged relationship with his son. Uh, that's the area, I think, where in the long-term gravitational movements here, uh, there could be some real questions. Do countries change their view of the Commonwealth Association when he becomes king? Mark, thanks very much indeed. Well, we'll be going to Australia in a moment to speak to Alexander Downer, former head of the Liberal Party uh, there, and also to Tricia Goddard, as you know, a, a broadcaster who's worked both sides at the Atlantic. But first, we're joined by Guy Hewitt, former High Commissioner of Barbados, which will leave the Commonwealth in November, a decision that we should say has been years in the making. It wasn't as a result of the last 24 hours. Um, but, Guy, uh, just talk us, if you can, through what Mark was calling that gravitational pull. Uh, what has that looked like for, for you and for Barbados? Good evening, all. For Barbados, the decision to become a republic reflects, in a sense, what this discussion really captures. The inconsistency between an institution, a monarchy, which reflects an oppressive, racist, um, colonial past, and where countries want to be and aspire to be for the future. And so the recent decision by the government of Barbados was informed by a number of facts. that the government is seeking and discussing issues of reparations for that legacy of, of 
and injustices of colonialism. Out of Black Lives Matter, we recognize that the history and the past does inform the present and can impact on the future. We got rid of the statue of Lord Nelson from our capital, which predated the one in Trafalgar, and we are starting to seriously interrogate our history as it informs the future. And I think this is where we realize that having the Her Majesty as the head of state of Barbados was not compatible with the aspirations of the majority of people who are Black, who are from the South, who are aspiring to move forward in an egalitarian manner, which monarchy and royalty doesn't speak to. So is this just, if you like, the march of history, or are there triggers along the way that, that hasten this? Do, do you feel that this is long overdue? Well, in a sense, it was for Barbados. It has been discussed for a number of decades. The Windrush scandal, where we saw the UK treat people born in Barbados in the Caribbean abominably in a very racist way that continues and has not been resolved today. The silence of, the, of Her Majesty on this matter, which took place just before the Commonwealth Summit, when she spoke out during the Scottish referendum on independence, it spoke to the, again, the inconsistency with somebody representing a white developed nation also trying to speak on behalf of the people of Barbados or people from the South. And that has to be reconciled, as was raised earlier in the program, with her role as the head of the Commonwealth, which promotes egalitarianism. And if it is that there are residues of racism lingering, it is going to be irreconcilable for the majority of the members of the Commonwealth who are people of colour. So will, will an interview like the one that was aired yesterday, will it have had any impact on your country or on how young uh, the people of Barbados feel? I would say that I think it kind of un underscores or affirms that Barbados did make the right decision to decide to have a native born citizen um, as, head of as head of state. I think it speaks to and in social media, young people are responding and, and really putting support behind the um, Harry and Meghan because any outcry, especially of a, a black woman must be given credibility, must be given support. This is not a battle between, um, this is not, or I should say racism is not a family matter. It's not a private matter. For the head of state, allegations of racism are very serious and go to the heart of being able to represent all of your people equitably yeah. and fairly. And just let me uh, to clear up uh, um, an inconsistency that I think I made. Y you will remain part of the Commonwealth, is that right? But you won't have... Barbados a... will be... Yes, we will have a, a native head of state, but we will remain part of the Commonwealth, as the majority of members are, which are republics. But what we will do now is have someone who re reflects the people of Barbados as our head of state. Guy Hewitt, great to hear those thoughts. Let's go to Alexander Downer. Um, can I ask you, sir, just to reflect on what you have heard from Guy Hewitt? Do you, do you think that Australia is moving in the same direction? Well, we deal with um, completely different issues from Barbados. We're, you know, brothers in the Commonwealth or sisters in the Commonwealth, and I know Guy. But, um, you know, the, the, the perspective there is, is, is as it is, but it's completely different, completely different from Australia. Um, so in terms of the issue of the Republic, we had a referendum in 1999. Um, it was defeated um, 55 to 45. And, and um, everybody wants to go near that issue at the moment. Um, um, you know, when the Queen's reign comes to an end, there'll be a push from the... Australian Republic for sure to have another referendum but you've got to change the constitution in Australia so it would be quite an upheaval and we're just the important thing to remember is perspective of all the thing all the things we have to deal with as a country not least the pandemic um, this couldn't be further down the batting order clearly. 
maybe not for you, but Malcolm Turnbull um, said today, your former uh, Australian Prime Minister, that the interview strengthened the case for becoming a republic. And he said, after the Queen's reign, do we want to have, in his words, whoever is the UK's head of state or do we want to have his own? What makes you convinced that that isn't shared by more Australians now? Well, Malcolm Turnbull may have been the Prime Minister, but he was also the chairman of the Australian Republican movement. So this is uh, his life's work to try and make Australia a republic. And he failed with the referendum in 1990. So let's just try again to keep things um, um, in some sort of perspective. Most Australians would see this as a very marginal issue. They've got many more important things to think about than pushing the country. I mean, just imagine now when we're wrestling with the pandemic like um, the UK is, um, deciding uh, um, to have a huge constitutional debate over, over the head of state when, you know, the current arrangement is the Governor General is the de facto head of state. There's huge admiration for the Queen. People love the Queen in Australia. Um, and, you know, move on. I mean, it, when the Queen's reign comes to an end, um, that issue will be readdressed, I think, and, and goodness knows how it will be because it depends when it happens and the circumstances and so on. But at the moment, it couldn't be, it, you know, it's just not, not a front of the mind issue for anyone. I guess, I, you know, I, I guess that's, that's true of, of constitutional issues at any time. They never feel um, that they have sort of SOS urgent yeah. written upon them. But I'm curious to know whether no. um, th the interview itself will have landed... Uh, with particularly with younger Australians, perhaps. What, 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 are you, what sense are you getting? Well, I'd say two things about the interview. First of all, well, um, for people who are fervent Republicans, that wouldn't be um, a big percentage of the population, but, you know, for whom this is their passion, um, they will uh, possibly, I'm not sure, they might see it as possibly helpful, I don't know. Um, but for most people, um, my guess, I'm just here, is that um, this is passing strange, this interview. Here are these incredibly rich people sitting in a luxurious California, um, bemoaning their woes and criticising the royal family, which, you know, whatever they say about the Queen, she's the head of it and the sim, so they're seen to be criticising an institution which has served us pretty well. Um, and complaining about their life when, you know, we're all the pandemic, we're wrestling with um, loss of jobs, and we're less wrestling with, the, in Australia's case, the collapse of the international tourism industry and so on. A couple of rich people going on TV, whinging about how they've been badly dealt with. I mean, honestly, I think for most Australians, that wouldn't be true of all. Um, there would be people who disagree with me, of course, that would be life. Um, but for most Australians, um, they look like privileged and entitled people, very rich, complaining too okay. much. Alexander Downer, thank you very much. I think we, we might find one uh, right now in Tricia Goddard, who's just uh, joined us. I don't know if you, were, if you could hear any of that, um, Tricia, but I can could. I ask you to, to respond uh, to, to, to that vision? Um, well, I, I've talked to Australian television just, just before this, and... Uh, um, obviously, I'm in America and I get feedback from Britain. Um, and I think there's different responses to uh, um, according to where you are. I think a lot of, I would say, uh, from my experience, definitely on social media, a lot of people, um, their younger people, their anger is actually reserved for the vitriol uh, from the media surrounding the interview. More so than Harry and Meghan, it's more about do we ha do things have to be so vitriolic? And especially the mental health message, there are so many young people, as we know, it's a very conservative estimate that one in four people at some time will have a mental health problem uh, severe enough to seek help. And I, I was a mental health advi government advisor, in fact, in Australia for some 10 years. And it was a huge problem. I mean, suicide amongst young Australian males is, uh, the figures are, are horrible. And so when they spoke about, you know, feeling so low and so awful, uh, and Harry himself also said he went through a very dark uh, period, no matter what the money, 
that seems to have resonated with young people. Yes, there are things about, you know, all, all the other things, but I have to say mm. on social media, that seems to have resonated. Look let me bring you back, if I can, to, to where we started, which is this discussion of, of how it's seen in, in the Commonwealth, because Harry and Meghan were a huge asset. Um, we remember their successes in Australia. They even talked yesterday of, of offering to spend a year uh, in South Africa, working specifically yes. for the Commonwealth. What do you think their, what effect will their departure and this interview have on, on, on specifically for the Commonwealth and, and Britain? I think it's a huge missed opportunity. I think Meghan was a huge missed opportunity because Harry and Meghan were obviously screaming into their pillows, you know, not being heard. Um, and, you know, first of all, I, I thought initially after the interview, I thought, oh, that's it. The, the royal family have really, really quite blown it. Um, they have a chance to claw some of that back a bit, uh, depending on how they deal with this, especially the the whole issue around racism. Um, certainly in Britain, um, young people of mixed heritage is the fastest growing group of, as you know, but all around, you know, for, for black people, for people of color, Meghan Markle is, a, it's honestly, I can't tell you such a huge beam of light, you know, all the work she did around Grenfell, that really echoed all around the Commonwealth. And again, on social media, I'm hearing people in Africa, South Africa, my show, where my show's been, Australia, all around the world. And they saw her as a young, modern person who was a mixture of all sorts of nationalities right. okay. and was willing to do everything. So I think how the royal family takes it from here will have a quite a marked bearing on whether, um, you know, Trisha. they claw back that asset. Trisha Goddard, great to speak to you. Thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you. Thanks to all our guests. Well, the impact of the pandemic has not been equal. The idea we've all been in it together simply incorrect. We're talking about data from COVID and it shows that those working in insecure frontline jobs and overcrowded homes with little financial ability to isolate have been hit the hardest. While in wealthier areas, people have been able to avoid some of the risk of COVID and work from home. Deb Cohen has been given exclusive data from Sheffield where this divide has been keenly felt. Sheffield is one fabulous city, but it's a city of divides and the, the west of the city is fairly affluent and the east of the city is, is less so. This is the story of how COVID-19 seeded itself in one of England's great Victorian cities. Heavy industry once brought some in Sheffield wealth, but not everyone. The workhouses may be long gone, but it is work and how the workers live that is so central to the story of what has happened here in the past 12 months. In London, it was the political classes who got COVID very early on in the pandemic. Here in Sheffield, it was people in wealthier areas, perhaps returning from February half-term ski trips, who got it first. For a time, there was a sense of we were all in it together. The idea was the impact of the virus didn't discriminate between the haves and the have-nots. A year on, it's become apparent that narrative is completely flawed. Sure, anyone can catch COVID, but if you're poor, if your work is insecure and can't be done from home, and if home itself is crowded, you're far, far more likely to catch it. Data from Sheffield passed exclusively to Newsnight reveals just how stark that divide is. This graphic maps how the virus spread across the city in the first wave last year. Look at the highlighted area. It contains some of Sheffield's poorest areas. Three weeks after the first cases in wealthier areas, there has barely been a positive case in the highlighted area. But if we scan forward to the end of June, we see how the majority of positive cases are confined to these deprived districts. That voice at the beginning of the piece belonged to Greg Fell. He's Sheffield's Director of Public Health. At the start of the pandemic, or before we knew it was going to happen, if you were to predict which part of Sheffield was going to be the worst hit, would you have been able this to...? This part. I'm probably surprised by the starkness of it, but, but it was always going to be something that was une unevenly or unequally split, um, and thus it's turned out to be, sadly.
Indeed, the analysis passed to Newsnight reveals something very interesting. We can see here the total COVID case rate for Sheffield's wealthiest 10% of people. Here are the case rates as you move through the income deciles from rich to poor. We can see rates are generally higher among the poor, but highest of all among the third poorest group. This is no statistical quirk. Put simply, while millions have worked from home, Decile 3 are the people who've had no choice but to be out on the front line day after day. And the impact is really Decile 3, the, the working poor, um, who are most likely to be in low pay, insecure contracts, inability to afford to isolate, therefore out and about more. The Rock Christian Centre Food Bank is at the heart of one of Sheffield's most deprived communities. I think that the biggest factor is this community is amazing. We've got the hospital where we've got people who work there from diverse backgrounds. A lot of frontline key workers, bus drivers, taxi drivers, takeaways, so they're on the front line having an interaction. If you're in another area and you've got a more affluent type of responsibility in society and a different career path, you're going to remove yourself from that. What was our greatest strength is now our greatness, weakness as a community because of that. There is a double whammy. It is those with no choice but to go out to work who often live in the kind of small, busy homes where COVID thrives. We have, because most of the, our, pay, uh, our community members are, uh, you know, low-paid workers. Like all the people here at the Furvale Community Hub, Raja Khan volunteers to help educate local people about COVID. They were on low-paid jobs when they were qualified, uh, and, uh, you know, so they couldn't afford bigger houses. You know, smaller houses and bigger families create, you know, uh, more illnesses, more, more people suffering from this illness. And believe you me, I've known people who are, who are valuable members of this community. The data from COVID infections are mapping onto already existing health inequalities in the city. The difference in healthy life expectancy can be as much as 20 years. Existing illnesses such as diabetes and heart disease may mean people getting sicker from COVID. As a local GP, Dr Jenny Joyce witnesses not only people here are more likely to get COVID, they had less good health in the first place. I think often these populations get labelled as being hard to reach and I don't think that's the case. It's not that they're hard to reach, it's that we underserve them because we don't provide services that they are able to access. These inequalities that are long-standing and have been there from a long time prior to the pandemic. So could we have done more? Should we have realised the combination of insecure, frontline work, financial insecurity and overcrowded housing was a potentially toxic combination for our poorest communities? I think if you'd asked people on the ground, if you'd asked you know, the people locally, um, local public health, they, they would have said, this is going to be the issue. These people are going to really struggle to self-isolate. But it's not just COVID that has disproportionately hit people in East Sheffield. It's also the non-COVID harms. A report prepared by Sheffield Citizens Advice Bureau says that those who were already struggling pre-COVID are in a worse position now. It cites factors including not being able to travel to cheaper food shops and higher heating and lighting costs from being at home. It says the poor have got into greater debt. What there isn't here is shock. Of course, there's grief for the many who have died. But when your area has a low life expectancy anyway, when money is always tight and when work is always precarious, COVID can feel like one more thing. Well, they've been in the situation and COVID's come and we've embraced one more, one more issue within that community, within this community. So yeah, we have, yeah, it's community resilience and, um, being able to know how to cope in difficult situations. So the risks people face day to day, this is just another one of those risks? Yeah, yeah, I would, I would say. In one sense, we've never seen anything like COVID. In another, it's not so unique. For those groups feeling its impact the most, the fact that they are is little surprise. Deb Cohen reporting there from Sheffield. Now, after a day's delay, the trial of Derek Chauvin, the police officer accused of the murder of George Floyd, begins in Minneapolis today. 
it was that death after the white policeman was filmed kneeling on the neck of the black man during an attempted arrest last May that sparked protest around the world under the banner of Black Lives Matter. Chauvin is charged with second-degree unintentional murder and manslaughter, but the Minnesota Court of Appeals ruled last Friday that a previous lesser charge of third-degree murder should be reinstated in the trial by the judge, Peter Cahill. Well, let's go to David Grossman, who's by the court in Minneapolis, to just explain a bit more. David, talk us through this. Well, Emily, if you didn't know anything about the history of this case, you could tell there's something pretty significant going on here inside the courthouse from the scale of the protection that's been erected around it. Layer after layer of concrete blocks of fencing, barbed wire and hundreds and hundreds of guardsmen, uh, National Guards men and women. The significance of this case is hard to overstate, both in terms of what happened in this city last May, the death of George Floyd and the wave of protest and rioting that erupted, not just here, but right across America and right around the world. Significance also in terms of the future. How does America begin to heal its racial divisions? Talking to people around this city, there's much trepidation about the events of the trial. If Derek Chauvin is not convicted of at least one count, there is a fear about what might happen here and across America. Today, the trial formally began with selecting the jury. Out of a pool of 250 potential jurors, they have to find 12 men and women and four alternates to uh, decide Derek Chauvin's fate. So it sounds an odd question to ask at the beginning of the trial, but what are the chances of, of conviction in all this? Well, you hinted at it at the beginning there. It's about the charges that he faces. He's facing two charges. The first is involuntary second degree murder. Now, for a conviction of that, the prosecution must prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Derek Chauvin caused uh, George Floyd's death while assaulting him. It carries a, a, a potential sentence of 10 to 15 years. But the cause of George Floyd's death will be contested by the defence. There will be much discussion of George Floyd's underlying health conditions and drug use. The second charge he faces is second degree manslaughter. Now, for a conviction on that, the prosecution must prove that Derek Chauvin was negligent and took an unreasonable risk. Now, that is obviously easier to prove, but it's not murder. That's why the prosecution wants to introduce that third charge of third degree murder. Okay. Uh, jury selection is going to carry on for another three weeks before the prosecution begins to present its case. David Grossman, thanks very much indeed. Now, in an Instagram age, perhaps everyone's a bit of a fake, but some, you could argue, a lot more than others. This is the story of a woman, Anna Sorokin, who came from a normal middle-class background and defrauded her way to £100,000 bank loans and New York hotel bills in a scam that finally landed her in prison. But it's also the story of the narrative the media built around her, calling her a fake heiress and a Manhattan socialite, a sociopath and a celebrity. These are the things she denies. Earlier, she spoke to Newsnight in her first UK broadcast interview to explain why she did it and where it all ended up. Before we hear it, here's a reminder. What do you mean you've never heard of Anna Delvey? She's an heiress, a Manhattan socialite, a would-be arts club owner, a bill dodger, a jailbird, oh, and a complete work of fiction. Fitting, perhaps, that she's about to become the star of a Netflix series about the woman who pretended to be her. Anna Sorokin. That's Anna Sorokin, the convicted scam artist. Born in Russia, her family moved to Germany when she was 16. After high school, she moved to London, then Paris, where she worked for a fashion magazine. She started calling herself Anna Delvey. She hit New York in 2013. Over the next four years, she lived the high life, documenting some of it through her Instagram account as her feet were snapped beside luxury swimming pools or in swanky hotel rooms. While she was showing off her lifestyle online, in truth, she was bouncing checks and forging documents to secure loans. She had a taste for champagne dinners, lavish holidays and $400 eyelash extensions. But she also had a taste for leaving bills unpaid or allowing others to pick up the tab. She once invited a friend on an all-expenses-paid holiday in Morocco. It cost the friend $62,000. But things were unravelling. That probably became obvious to Anna when she was arrested in 2017. Two years later, she was found guilty of scamming more than $200,000 from banks and luxury hotels. She was sentenced to between four and 12 years in jail, spending 21 months in Rikers Island, New York, followed by 20 months at a correctional facility. But before she'd even spent her first night behind bars, Netflix had come calling. Once Anna had been convicted, the streaming giant had to tread carefully. 
there are laws preventing convicted criminals from profiting by their crimes. Netflix notified the courts, and it was agreed that a deal could be done. But the $320,000 paid by Netflix was placed into a designated hold so that the banks and others she had conned could seek to recover their money. Now she's at liberty, back on social media and embracing the limelight and ready to see her story told. She said she feels little remorse for her actions, a state of mind some observers have called sociopathic. To others, it's blunt honesty. A woman with nothing makes her name as a fake, serves time in prison and then remakes her name as a celebrity. Almost as if, well, crime pays. If people said to you, Anna, why do you deserve this chance to tell your story? You are a crook, a thief, a liar, a criminal, and a really bad friend. Why do you deserve your chance to tell it? What would you say to our viewers? Um, I mean, because I can, I don't really feel like I should be listening what people tell me what I deserve or don't deserve. I feel like there's just so many people who want to hear my side of the story and I feel like it's my right to give it to them. Why wouldn't I deserve this? Why would everyone else have a chance to tell my story for me? That would just make no sense. I'm just like trying to address the allegations made against me. I'm trying to work out if there was, if there was a game plan in what you did. Well, I did some things, but I never felt like I had criminal intentions and I never felt like people will be deprived of their property permanently. So I, I'm looking back at it, I understand what I did wrong and I took some shortcuts, but in my head, I never was trying to like do anything bad to anyone. So when, for that year, uh, you were posing as a, a Manhattan socialite, daughter of a diplomat, um, you were falsifying bank records, forging an identity to scam, why did you do it? Was it about power? Was it money? Was it game? Was it accidental? I think that's a big misconception. I felt like the social media is to blame for all of that because I never posed as anything. Like I was just doing my thing. I never really like, I never went out. I never said I was a socialite. I was actually never my goal to be one. And um, people like fit the pieces into the story they wanted to hear. So you're blaming social media for- I'm not blaming social media. I'm saying they played a huge part in creating me as well as the prosecution. But you're not denying your actions. I mean, you, you falsified bank records and you forged an identity and you scammed uh, banks. You, you fundraised for a foundation that didn't exist. That's all real. Well, my case is under appeal, so no comment to that. You, ne you said you never intended to defraud your friend, but her card ended up paying for your holiday. Why would you have taken this luxury, all expenses paid holiday if you knew you couldn't afford it? Uh, at the time I booked it, I could afford it. And we couldn't cancel the reservation. Um, I was under the impression they pre-authorized my card and like the authorization fell off after a couple of weeks. I feel bad. I felt like I never had any intent to defraud her because I never knew her card would even ever go through for that charge. And she offered and it all happened in a very short span of time. It like all happened pretty much in one afternoon. I felt like I should have never let her pay for it. I should have never brought myself into that position, but I never... Like, and she even knows I never planned on doing this to her. Are you making a plan now to pay the rest of that $62,000 back to I her? am, yes. Do you believe that we live in an age uh, where it's easy to fake it, whether it's, you know, Instagram and your image and, and filters or whether it's repeating lies? It's hard for me to comment for everyone. Um, I feel like you should never assume that everyone is stupid and like, that one person is just so smart. So um, I guess that's a mistake that I made when I was younger. I just thought I was so smart and everyone else just like was stupid. Um, I don't know. I feel it's like it's just history repeating itself. If you just like look back, there were just so many people that you would like call them con artists and um, they kind of did a similar thing. I don't think so. It's just under different circumstances and they have different platform. 
Are you proud to be called a con artist? Do you think of it as a badge of honor? Absolutely not. I feel it's an inaccurate. Is it right to say you have no regrets? Um, I feel like regret is a useless feeling. I feel like I said it so many times. I felt like I did some things wrong and I'm just trying to fix them. I look up the definition of regret and it just pretty much says feeling sad. Do I feel sad? I don't feel so. At all. Like I did what I did. I would not do this again. And I'm just trying to fix it. I just don't know what else people are expecting from me. And if people said you, you, you don't have an obvious sense of regret, um, you committed fraud, you got caught, you served time in prison, and now you're earning very decent money from it. You're looking for rehabilitation, I guess, even in interviews like this. Has crime paid for you? Is it paying now? Uh, in a way it did, but I'm not really trying to um, sit here and like go on every show, tell everyone, oh, how I did it. I'm trying to like turn it around and actually do something good out of it. I'm not going to write a book on how I did it or like, oh, you can be just like me. So I don't feel like it would be an appropriate thing to do. So I don't, I feel it's a little bit ridiculous that um, I just got so much attention to begin with, but it's just like, it's been, I never really asked for any of this. I never asked for Netflix to buy my story. It just happened. And there were so many other people involved. Like I signed a contract, but everything else, it just like, it just spun completely out of my control. It's not like I orchestrated anything. Anna Sarkin, it's great to speak to you. Thank you very much for talking to us. And that brings us to the end of the programme tonight. That's all we have time for, but thank you for joining us. I'll be back tomorrow. Hope to see you then. Bye-bye.